Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Steve. And so um, I'd like to get off uh, to an early start. You've all gotten up early, either here locally or streaming in. And uh, talk about what I enjoy talking about a lot is the food prescription approach to the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Now, even though you see cardiovascular disease listed there, you can actually remove cardiovascular disease and insert in the blank whatever chronic ailment that you want to insert. And so we're going to talk about a new paradigm shift that is needed. And what we're trying to do in Houston is trying to optimize and develop the prototype for that paradigm shift. Um, let's get my clicker working here. So as uh, Steve mentioned, uh, my day job consists of uh, working as an ordinary cardiologist. I'm a cardiologist, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. That means I specialize and subspecialize in heart rhythm disorders. And so individuals who are at risk for not only having a heart attack, but you may be at risk of dying suddenly or passing out or something like that, you may see a cardiac electrophysiologist. And uh, so my day job may consist of prescribing medications or doing coronary angiograms or, or implanting defibrillators or pacemakers or the like or admitting people to the CCU. But what I like to do in my day job or weekend job or after hours job is help people avoid the need for my day services. And that's where I do the work with Montgomery Heart and Wellness. I uh, go around the country speaking as I am now. And uh, we have a program in our facility that actually transition individuals who come in with the chronic ailments and 21 medications and many surgeries, and we halt those diseases and transition them to this different approach. And we'd like to talk to you about uh, the details of how we do that. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to go over the overview of some epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. We'll talk about some of the risk factors, the, some that are modifiable. Uh, we'll talk about some of the key lifestyle factors that contribute to heart disease. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of insight on the state of our therapies. What do we do in the standard of care? I practice in the largest medical center in the world. And um, we have a lot to offer for someone with heart disease, but oftentimes it costs a lot. And we'll talk about that. But we'll talk about some of the historical things, some of the nutritional interventions that have been done by people that's come before me, some people that you know, Dr. Esselson. We'll talk about some of his work and Dr. Ornish's work. And uh, we'll give you some insight into the biochemistry and physiology of uh, heart disease and how nutrition biochemically positively affects heart disease. So there's science behind this, as you may have heard from other talks, in terms of how this works. So this isn't just willy-nilly stuff that we're doing. And uh, I'll give you some case presentation. I think it's always important uh, to bring home uh, the message by looking at individual patients that we've treated, and we'll look at some of the clinical data. So let's go a few housekeeping items here. Uh, I'm from Texas, and uh, I don't know if anybody else is from Texas, but y'all recognize this uh, thing here? What is this? Is any other? Pickup truck. <laughs> and so we drive this in Texas, and uh, we don't ride horses, as people often ask me. Do you have a horse? I don't have a horse. I've never ridden a horse. But uh, this is actually my pickup truck. And I like showing it off. It's, it was just washed before I took this picture. And here is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the abdominal on this pickup truck. Y'all see that number? 299,999. And the next picture shows the milestone, 300,000. This pickup truck, and this was February of this year, February of 2015, actually. Uh, this pickup truck achieved the milestone of 300,000 miles. Now, why am I making such a big deal of that? Well, I've had this pickup truck from, you know, the very beginning. I've taken care of the pickup truck. I enjoy it. Uh, and the reason I was able to get to 300,000 miles is actually at 319,000 miles now. But the reason I was able to get there is because I always put the best oil in the pickup truck. I always gave it the best fluid exchange. And so I gave it this fluid exchange on a regular basis, change out the gaskets and filters, et cetera, i.e., my pickup truck went through a nutritional detox on a regular basis. And it got the best nourishment, the best nutrients, and as a result of this, it's over 300,000 miles, still driving well. I pass up lots of vehicles that don't feed their, lots of individuals don't feed their vehicles well on the side of the road. Uh, so the engine is still going strong, 
And so very much like my pickup truck, your body requires the optimal nutrition to go the long run. And so we're going to talk about some of that down the road. But first of all, let's talk about the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. You may have seen some of this data before. Uh, heart disease is the most common cause of death in the United States, about one in four deaths, about 600,000 people have died. Um, coronary disease kills, uh, contributes to this greatly, uh, 380,000 people annually. About 720,000 individuals uh, <clears throat> have a heart attack every year, and it costs us quite a bit. Almost $109, $110 billion a year is the price tag we pay for coronary heart disease. So why is this the case? If you look at this slide, and this slide tells a lot of things, you notice that the bar graphs on the left, and there are different age groups. At the far left, there's an age group of men and women, 20 to 34. Uh, and you go to the next bar graph, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and so on to 75 plus. Notice how the bar graphs get higher. Uh, the blue bar graphs are for men, the red bar graphs are for women. And notice, in the younger ages, the blue bar graphs are taller than the red bar graphs. That means more women, excuse me, more men have heart disease in those younger ages than there are women. So the prevalence of heart disease in ages 20 to 34, 35 to 44 is higher in men than women. But something interesting happens once you get to the age of 45 to 50 and older. The red bar graphs catch up and pass the blue bar graphs, which shows that there's a higher prevalence of heart disease in women than men in these older ages. And in fact, now, probably since 2010, 2011, more women are dying from heart disease than men. Women, heart disease has become a woman's disease now. So that's one point. The other point, which is obvious, is that everybody, men and women, as we get older, the prevalence of heart disease increases, which implies that as aging is a, a natural progression of heart disease is, is with aging. So is that natural that we should just, the heart should just simply weaken and become more diseased as we get older? I don't think so. And we'll talk about possibly why that happens. But the third thing I'd like to point out with this slide is something that it doesn't show. If you look at the bar graph of the age group 20 to 34, and look at the blue bar graph that represents the prevalence of heart disease in men at that age group, and it shows, shows about 11% of men have heart disease in the age group of 20 to 34. But we know that that is misleading because there are autopsy studies that were done back in the mid-1950s where it looked at, they did autopsies of male soldiers who died in the Korean War. And they looked at their hearts, about 300 soldiers, and in autopsy studies, almost 80%, about 77% of those men had gross plaque in their arteries. This is on autopsy studies. Subsequent autopsy studies have shown the same thing or similar data. So if you take the bar graph, 24 to 22 to 34, and you compare it to that to the autopsy data of these soldiers, and by the way, the average age of these soldiers was 22, it actually shows that instead of being 11%, it's really up here. So the bar graph for men doesn't really start here in this age group. It starts here. Well, why is there a discrepancy? There's a discrepancy because Men at this age don't go see the doctors, don't get EKGs, don't get stress tests and the like, and the sensitivity of an EKG is less than 50%. So if you get an EKG and it's normal, you still may have coronary disease. So you're going to miss a lot of disease. Why they caught it in the autopsy study, because these individuals were killed for other reasons. Gunshot wounds, helicopter wounds, and so they went and looked in their hearts and saw that, wait a minute, these guys apparently didn't have symptoms, they were physically fit, they were athletic, they were soldiers, they were, many of them were, were thin, but despite that, they had gross plaque in the artery. So an autopsy is going to give you a sensitivity that an EKG or just a routine screening exam can't. So you're able to pick up here. Now, the problem is, if the prevalence in this age group of men, and likely women, is not here, but here, and you take my little arrow, and we know that as you get older, the prevalence gets higher. What if we started our arrow here and then shoot it up? Then what is the prevalence of heart disease in, say, 35, 40, 45, 50, et cetera? Virtually universal. So if you on the standard American diet, and I'll prove that point more later, but my opinion is if you on the standard American diet, 
and you age over 35 or even over 30, you very likely have heart disease, virtually 100%. I'll give it 99.9, .9, give you a chance. But the point is that the lifestyle gives you a 100% chance of having some form of heart disease. And many people have it. That's why it's the number one cause of death and morbidity. And there are many people who have heart disease who are asymptomatic. And so they're just walking around like time bombs. But what are some of the risk factors? Predisposing risk factors, we know of them. Hypertension is one, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and obesity and being overweight, which actually ties into some of these others. Uh, about 31% of our population have hypertension. About a third have uh, hyperlipidemia with a total cholesterol greater than 200. If you uh, look at uh, subparticles, uh, that number is probably higher. Diabetes, nearly 10%. Um, that number could be higher because there are a lot of individuals with prediabetes who has insulin resistance. They may have a relatively low um, uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C but may still have prediabetes, obesity, and overweight, about 70% of the population. So these predisposing factors contribute to heart disease. If you look at hypertension, similar type progression over as with age, with hypertension, as you see with heart disease. The younger the group, the lower the incidence of hypertension, the older, the higher the prevalence. If you look at diabetes, the prevalence of diabetes in our population uh, from 1980 to 2010, it was almost an exponential growth in uh, the prevalence of diabetes. And so we're seeing these chronic illnesses grow and develop over time uh, that, again, these are the contributing factors to, to uh, heart disease. It's estimated by the CDC that from children born after the year 2000, about one in three will have diabetes before adulthood or by the time they're adults. And so, again, another major contributing factor to heart disease. How about behavioral uh, risk factors? Smoking, you know, there's a lot of uh, campaigning against smoking, and we've done a great job of, of reducing the incidence of smoking. Fewer than 20% of the population smoke now. Uh, how about excessive alcohol use? About 16%. But the problem with smoking and alcohol, I just gave you data suggesting that the prevalence of heart disease is almost universal, it's almost 100%. So can you really blame it on smoking with fewer than one in five people smoke, but a large percentage of people with heart disease? You really can't. Smoking in and of itself, by itself, is not enough of an explanation as to why we're having so much heart disease. Same thing with alcohol use, which is another major behavioral problem. But if we start to look at physical inactivity, you know, we are a sedentary uh, society. And so approximately 60% of the people are sedentary, and so that certainly could contribute to uh, coronary heart disease and other chronic illnesses. But how about poor dietary habits? Now this 80% estimate is probably an underestimate because it looks at poor dietary habits and the usual definition of poor dietary habits probably has a lot to do with people eating fried foods and, and the worst stuff that you can think of. Uh, but if you just include everybody who eats any form of animal protein on a regular basis, uh, that poor dietary habit percentage can go up, probably in the 90% range. So our behavioral factors certainly have an impact. But what about exercise? Can I just have my cheeseburger and run it off? I mean, that's a common uh, understanding. I mean, if I eat a little bad food every now and then, I'll just, you know, work out a little extra. Well, you may recognize a person in this picture. If you don't, his name is Jim Fix. Uh, Jim Fix was a well-known uh, runner and author of uh, the uh, Complete Book of Running. Uh, and at the age of 51, Jim died suddenly of a cardiac arrest. Uh, and you see Gene, Jim, he's lean and mean, an athletic machine. Uh, but he was found dead, and when they autopsied his heart, all three of his major arteries had about 90-plus percent uh, blockage, including the one that led to the uh, heart attack. So if you look at someone like this, does he look like someone with uh, heart disease? No. Uh, and people say, well, it's in his genes. But he doesn't wear jeans. He's a runner. <laughs> so we can't blame it on his genes. Uh, we have to look at something else. And it probably has a lot to do with what he's eating. So the other factors that the American soldiers I talked about earlier, 
in the 1950s. These are survivors of the Korean War, average age 22. About 78%, almost 78% had gross coronary plaque. These men were lean, physically fit, military men, but despite that, they had coronary disease. So you can't outrun bad food. You can't run it, if you put it in your mouth, you can't run it off. As I said last night in the panel, I'll talk to my patients, I said, look, if you put a drop of cyanide in your coffee, how far do you have to run to run it off? You know, it's a ridiculous question because it's the biochemistry of the cyanide that you're worried about, it's not the calories. And it shouldn't be the calories of the food that we're concerned about. I really don't care that, you know, a cheeseburger has lots of fat and lots of calories. We understand the fat and calories are a problem. But it's the biochemistry of the food, the biochemical reactions that it set off that really cause the problem. Because somebody's going to invent a low-fat, low-calorie cheeseburger that's just as toxic as the high-fat, high-fat calorie cheeseburger because it's not normal food. So we want to talk about that. It's the food. So let's look at our food. Um, you may have seen these slides before. You know, from 1900 to 2000, our overall meat consumption has gone up in the United States from about less than 150, right at 150 pounds per person to about 202 pounds per person. And many people come to my office and say, well, doc, I don't eat much meat. I cut back on the meat. And to some extent, when they say that, to a large extent when they say that, they're talking about red meat. And so that's true. Many people have reduced red meat in our country. Red meat reduction has gone down. Uh, but what's happened is the uh, chicken has gone up exponentially. Those Chick-fil-A commercials have made a big impact on our society. And so we see the exponential uh, increase in chicken over time. Yes, where's the beef? Well, it's for dinner. It's still available. This is an image of uh, T-bone steak with a little pus coming out of there. And just a little reminder of this meat that you're eating, this is from diseased animals. And so the uh, butcher's pretty good. He'll scoop out most of this, a little, little bit for flavoring. And uh, he'll cut that up and they'll season it, put it on your plate, and uh, you're ready uh, to have dinner. And so you don't see that, but you're eating that stuff. You're eating pus, eating all sorts of other diseases with these animals. How about cheese? Wow, exponential growth in cheese over time, again from 1900 to 2000. Amount of cheese have almost gone up by tenfold. Okay, so we eat a lot, eat a lot of cheese. Um, sugar. Now there's a big campaign against sugar. Okay, all oh, the sugar. It's the sugar. You know, get rid of the sugar. Carb busters, low carb. Well, let's look at the data from about the 1960s, 2002. If you look at this red bar, it's a little bit complex slide. The red bar shows sugar going up over time, but also taking a little bit of a dip probably from 1996 to 2002, sugar drops. But if you look at the cause of this increase in sugar, uh, the blue graph shows natural cane and beet sugar going down. But what's going up? High fructose corn syrup. So really the increase in sugar is a lot of processed sugars that we're consuming over time. So, you know, sugar isn't bad, bad sugar is bad. I mean, sugar in the form of fruits and vegetables and things like that, natural sugars, and they're in their natural state. And so they're good for the body. It's just that we're eating, consuming a lot of processed sugars, and that's the problem. Now, let me show you a little comparison slide. Let's take diabetes, because that's a major problem. It contributes to heart disease. And you look at the exponential growth in diabetes from 1980 to 2010. Now, let's look at the change in our dietary habits. Now, many people think that diabetes is due to sugar, right? So if the prevalence of diabetes is going up, it should match the prevalence of increased consumption of sugar if it's the diabetes, right? But look at this curve here, okay? This curve does not go up like this. It kind of goes up, and then it plateaus and actually comes down. Now, if you superimpose this curve over here, and the data is from 1960s on, so it probably goes back farther, but from this point here of the curve forward and superimpose up here, this curve would actually go here. In fact, from 96 to 2002, the, the amount of sugar consumption has decreased in the population, still not matching up to the increased prevalence of diabetes. But then look at the cheese and look at the chicken. You can almost superimpose these graphs on top of there. Now, this isn't scientific what I'm doing here, but I'm making a point that it's not obvious 
that our increased consumption in sugar matches the increased prevalence of diabetes. In fact, it's obvious that it doesn't match it. And so we have to think beyond this whole concept of sugar causing diabetes. Uh, there's evidence that sugar really doesn't cause diabetes. It's the uh, meat consumption. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not the first to come up with this. Many uh, physicians came before me, uh, were able to apply uh, nutrition in treating cardiovascular disease. Dr. Lester Morrison, back in 1946, this is probably a couple of years before the famous Framingham, Framingham study, he took two groups of individuals, two groups of 50 individuals who had survived a heart attack. One group he had put on a low meat, low fat diet. The other group had put them on a regular diet, continue to eat what they were eating. And he followed them over 12 years, which I find was remarkable. Uh, and essentially what he found was a 38% survival benefit in the individual who had the experimental diet. So just by reducing it, he didn't remove all the meat. He reduced the amount of meat consumption and fat in one group and the other group ate the regular amount, just by simply reducing it, he had a 38% survival benefit. And so at the end of uh, <clears throat> 12 years, about 19 people survived who were on the experimental diet. Everybody who ate the regular diet was dead by then. So a pretty significant uh, improvement. Uh, you all know about Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn, back in 1985, uh, started following 23 patients. Uh, five of them dropped out of his study, and he put them on a plant-based diet and followed them for five years. Uh, he did follow the five individuals as a control group, so 18 on plant-based diet, five on the regular diets who didn't want to follow the program. And what he saw is that he saw a decrease in total cholesterol from 246 milligrams uh, to 132 in that period of time. Uh, reduction in coronary events, they were having few episodes of chest discomfort compared to prior to starting the study. Uh, and interesting enough, about 11 patients out of the 18 that he had, <clears throat> 11 of them underwent repeat coronary angiograms. And on average, you saw a 7% reduction. So the arteries open up by 7% uh, on the coronary angiograms, which had a significant uh, uh, contribution to improving coronary flow. So five of the individuals who did not uh, follow the program had more coronary events uh, subsequent to this uh, time period. So <clears throat> here's a diagram of uh, one of his patients who had a significant uh, LAD lesion. And after about three years, a repeat angiogram, uh, this lesion had reversed. And so the body heals itself in the setting of, of uh, nutrition, of proper nutrition. Dr. Dean Arnish, whom you're familiar with, did the lifestyle heart trial. Uh, and again, he showed, he took uh, patients and put them on a low-fat, uh, no-animal diet. He also added exercise, meditation, and breathing relaxation techniques. He used no drugs or surgeries, important. Uh, and what did he see? Well, in the study group, reduction in cholesterol from 227 milligrams to 172. The LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, went from 152 to 95. And there's an average of 4% regression of coronary artery stenosis on individuals that repeat angiogram. This is after one year. And he had a 91% reduction in the frequency of chest pain uh, in that one year period of time. Compared to the control group, these are guys that did not follow this program, did the usual thing, had significantly worse cholesterol levels, had 165% increase in chest discomfort, had an 8% increase in coronary artery stenosis. So, on this side, the, the, the study group, the arteries open up by 4%. In the non-study group, the arteries closed up by another 8%. So it's really a 12% differential. The point here is critical because there's no in-between. Notice there are only two sides. The study group got better. The control group got worse. And we have a concept that if I just continue to do what I'm doing, everything will stay the same. I have this amount of heart disease. I feel okay now. So why do I need to go through this drastic lifestyle change when I can just sort of keep doing what I'm doing now, go for a little walk, a little jog, eat my little chicken and fish every now and then? The problem is that you won't stay where you are. You have two options. You can get better or you can get worse. There's no in between. And so that's one thing that we have to understand is that these lifestyle changes, not only are they helping us get better, but they're keeping us from getting worse. And that's the, so if you had one stroke, then you're trying to graduate to two strokes. If you had a mild heart attack, you're graduating to a major heart attack. 
if your pumping function is 55 percent, you're trying to get it down to 45, then 35, then we implant your defibrillator. So you're only getting worse over time if you're not making these changes. So is this hocus pocus? Or is there some scientific evidence? We know that uh, leafy greens have nitrates in it. Uh, results in the formation of nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator, so the arteries dilate. So when you start to eat lots of leafy greens on a regular basis, within days you start to have the coronary arteries dilate. Uh, it improves the vascular endothelial function. Uh, that decreases clotting and does a lot of wonderful things for coronary flow. Um, the mitochondrial uh, oxidative phosphorylation, that's the amount of uh, how efficient you convert oxygen to ATP. So if you're jogging and breathing, and uh, maybe if you're out of shape and you're eating bad food, you may have to take 10 breaths you know, for a certain amount of ATP production so your muscles can work effectively. But if you eat lots of deep leafy greens, veggies, that conversion of oxygen to ATP is much more efficient. So maybe I only have to take five breaths after consuming. There's data showing that your exercise capacity improves with consuming plant-based foods, particularly with leafy greens. And mitochondrial function, uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction, which can be reversed, leads to reversal of insulin resistance and leads to reversal or uh, improvement of myocyte function. The heart can pump better, uh, uh, theoretically. What are the mechanisms of insulin uh, resistance? We talk about the whole concept or myth, if you will, of how sugar contributes to diabetes. But how is it, what is it that causes diabetes? Well, data, scientific data has shown that with animal fat consumption, fat, saturated fat consumption, mostly from animals, uh, you have an intramyocellular lipid accumulation, which results in insulin receptor dysfunction. That's probably mediated through mitochondrial uh, uh, dysfunction as well. And so when you have insulin receptor dysfunction, these insulin receptors don't respond to insulin very well. And so glucose, as the insulin receptors are like a key to allow the, the cells to take up glucose, glucose uptake is impaired. And so with the impairment of glucose uptake as a result of the fact that insulin receptors are impaired, you develop what's called insulin resistance. Early on in this phase, the pancreas just secretes more insulin. So if the insulin receptors are not working as well, maybe you can compensate by producing more insulin. As a result of that, you can overcome it. So your blood sugar may stay normal. And we have a lot of our patients, we'll draw their labs and we'll measure insulin levels. We'll see an increase in insulin levels, even though the blood sugar is normal. But over time, as more insulin receptor defectiveness occurs, the pancreas starts to wear out. And it doesn't, is not able to compensate. So at that point in time, the blood sugar starts to go up. And so you start to get diabetes. But for years, you can have insulin resistance. And it's not so much the blood sugar by itself that's causing problems, but high insulin levels can cause problems too. And so that can lead to myocardial hypertrophy. It can lead to smooth muscle cell abnormalities in the vasculature. So individuals who are not diabetics, quote unquote, but pre-diabetics, as we call them, who have insulin resistance, they'll have insulin resistance for many years. And they'll be laying down the groundwork for coronary artery disease, heart failure, et cetera, long before they get the diagnosis of diabetes. And in my, my opinion, patients I come in, once you've been diagnosed with diabetes, you have heart disease until proven otherwise, because you've had this long track of this insulin resistance that's also causing biochemical abnormalities physiologically, that's adversely affecting you physiologically and contributing to heart disease. Now, when you're consuming plant foods, there's this myth about uh, well, if I only eat a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, I've got to mix my food very carefully. You know, I've got to you know, go into the chemistry lab and you know, make sure I'm getting this mixed with that so that I get the perfect nutrient, the perfect protein. But if you really analyze the food composition, let's take about 500 calories of plant-based food and 500 calories of animal-based food. This slide is from Dr. T. Colin Campbell's uh, book, um, the, the China study. And oh, by the way, this is from Dr. Uh, Neil Barnett's book on reversing diabetes. I want to get that uh, point across. It's at the bottom of my slide. Um, if you look at this, uh, comparing plant foods to animal foods, if you look at cholesterol and fat, animal-based foods clearly are superior. Cholesterol, zero on plants. Animal-based foods, about 137 milligrams for 500 calories. 
I mean, think about it. Broccoli and spinach doesn't have a liver, so it's not going to produce, produce cholesterol. Plants don't have livers, so they don't make cholesterol. You won't be consuming cholesterol in plant foods that you consume. Uh, fat. You can get fat in plant foods and seeds uh, and nuts, uh, but 500 calories average uh, plant foods, 4 grams compared to about 36 grams in animal foods. Now, if you look at all the other nutrients, protein, about equal, and all the phytonutrients, these are the cancer-fighting uh, nutrients, these are the nutrients that have, for, help for cell repair. All of these are superior in plant foods compared to animal foods. So clearly, in summary, multiple clinical studies showing plant-based nutrition, reversing heart disease, uh, the composition of plant foods is superior to animal foods, which probably uh, explains that, and also this biochemical mechanism that underscores the mechanism by which plant foods uh, are superior to animal foods in contributing to improvement of cardiovascular disease. So I'm in, I work in the world's largest medical center, so patients will come with heart failure or heart attacks. You know, what do we have to offer them? This is the state of the art of uh, treating patients with heart disease. Uh, we have many pills, many prescriptions, um, uh, and about 70% of U.S. citizens are on prescription medication. About a quarter of us are taking five or more prescription medications. There's a whole list of different categories. Uh, this list of categories are, are longer than when I, you know, put this slide together now. There are different indications. As we discover different biochemical pathways, we come up with different drugs to treat them. There are many medical devices now. We can uh, repair your heart valve with a catheter, so the technology is, is advancing. Uh, however, the cost is advancing. If you look at this slide, this is the top richest, 10 richest countries based on gross domestic product. United States being number one, China, Japan, etc. Look here at the number six position. It's actually 11 on here. And the number six position is United States expenditure on health care. The amount of money we spend on health care would make us the richest, sixth richest country in the world. So the amount of money we spend on health care is more than the gross domestic product of the United Kingdom, Italy, Brazil. Uh, so we spend more money on sick care than the entire country's gross domestic product. So the price and the price tag continues to go up. So needless to say, a paradigm shift uh, is necessary. The cost continues to rise. Many healthcare advances don't reach uh, individuals that it needs to go to. They're too costly. Uh, they're not accessible. Everyone doesn't live near the, uh, you know, the world's largest medical center. Uh, heart disease is essentially a foodborne illness. And so genetics play a small role. The standard Western diet uh, is uh, the key factor. And again, we're only treating the side effects of the bad food that we eat. So even if you have access to the advanced medical technology, uh, the disease will progress because the disease is not coronary disease, the disease is bad food disease. And until you treat that, uh, you don't uh, get the results you need. So what do we need? We need a new mental construct. We need a new mental construct in terms of how we think about disease as opposed to uh, the isolated diagnosis. As I mentioned in the panel last night, in medical school we were trained to look at Isolated conditions, high blood pressure, allergies, hypertension, obesity, heart failure, kidney failure, arthritis, etc. In fact, if you look at the medical training, think of the specialties. Just look at internal medicine itself. So you go and you learn internal medicine, you can specialize in renal disease, you can specialize in arthritis, you can specialize in heart disease, you can specialize in all these things. We're trained and designed, the medical industry is designed to treat diseases in isolation. But there's one common contributing factor, which is poor nutrition. And unfortunately, most of the, we spend most of our money and time up here, and we're not treating a common denominator. So an individual who has heart disease and their cholesterol is high, they're going to get treated for hypertension or heart disease, get a statin drug, and then they'll develop diabetes, and they'll go see a diabetes specialist, get put on diabetes medication, <clears throat> and then they'll have side effects to any of those drugs, maybe get treated for arthritis. And so as we treat these things in isolation, we're creating more problems. Uh, we need to think, rethink disease in terms of its common base. Henceforth, the food prescription approach to treating cardiovascular disease or the food prescription approach to treating any chronic illness. 
So what are the underlying concepts? <clears throat> Toxin input. On a regular basis, the average U.S. citizen or westernized citizen consumes a large amount of food that's toxic. Now, I'm not talking about fried chicken and steak, etc. I'm talking about just baked fish or baked chicken, okay? Lean chicken, lean chicken breast without the skin has a major toxic effect. And so if we're consuming a lot of toxins, the body, mach body's machinery is impaired in such a way that it doesn't remove toxins very well. In other words, if I'm consuming a lot of animal protein, I may get constipated. If I'm constipated, I'm not removing, eliminating about the food, the nutrients or toxins from my GI tract. My liver may become congested for all the ammonia that's having to be converted uh, in the liver from the animal protein. So then the liver becomes impaired. So the organs that are designed to cleanse, repair, and keep the body healthy and fit are impaired by the consumption of these toxic foods. And so then our toxin removal is impaired. So the concept is if we remove the toxins, then the body will then do its natural thing. So the whole concept of detox is to stop the, the consumption of toxic foods. Many people often will go by herbs and supplements and things that increase bowel elimination, increase urinary elimination, and they say, well, I'm doing a detox. The problem is they don't remove everything from their diet. They may continue to eat a little chicken or a little fish or, you know, they may splurge here and there. But the whole concept of removing toxins from the system is absolute removal. When you absolutely remove these things, then the body starts to heal itself and it starts to repair itself and cleanse itself. It's as simple as that. So the new standard consists of the following. We have a, a clinic. Uh, these are some pictures of our facility here. Um, and patients come in and we do a general history and physical examination, as like uh, anyone do. But we'll do a detailed nutritional history. You may have heard Dr. Clapper last night talk about how, you know, he asked his patients, what are you putting in your mouth? This is very important. You know, somebody's eating three buckets of fried chicken every day compared to somebody's eating a little piece of fish and chicken once a week. You know, it's still not perfect, but I have an idea of where they're coming from. And, and I'll have an idea as to how uh, hard their detox will be and how hard their detox symptoms will be. So I have a, I get a de my nutritionist will get a detailed nutritional history. We'll get some idea of the activity level. You know, are you exercising? Are you getting outdoors? Are you getting sunshine? Uh, and we'll make biochemical assessment. We get blood tests that can look at detail uh, biomarkers in terms of stress, looking at stress on the heart, stress on the liver. Uh, we'll make physiological assessments, treadmill stress tests, we check the hemodynamics, uh, and we'll assign a clinical category. So we'll make some assessment as to how quote unquote sick this patient is because uh, some patients are very sick and I'll have to admit them right to the hospital. We've had patients coming in and, and cardiac arrhythmias and massive pulmonary emboli in the office. And we have to you know, send them to the hospital and we'll start in the hospital with the same approach they get on a raw fruits and vegetable diet in the hospital, it's the Montgomery diet is known of, but we'll treat them in the hospital in the same way that we may treat them in the office, even though we may have to treat more aggressive, uh, use more aggressive therapies. Now, we do optimize the standard medical surgical therapies. Uh, you know, we may have to add or reduce medications. We frequently see people coming in with 15, 20, 30 medications, and so we'll have to reduce some. And, and add a new one that may be more potent and say a couple of different medications, try to simplify the regimen. And we'll con consider possible needs for surgeries and other procedures. I mean, I still do heart casts and in implant defibrillators. And some patients, whose hearts are very weak. They're at increased risk of sudden death. They may need a defibrillator, but it doesn't mean that they cannot, you know, um, uh, continue. It doesn't mean that they can continue their lifestyle just because they're getting a surgical procedure. Okay, so they get a surgical procedure, and it's my opinion that anybody who needs an angioplasty bypass surgery or, or defibrillator implant, anybody who uses that much, you know, cost in the healthcare system should be mandated to go plant-based. It should be, you know, government law. I don't know if we should put it in the Constitution or something, but the point is that uh, once you're at this advanced stage, you really need a plant-based uh, nutritional intervention in addition to any other surgical procedure that we have to uh, uh, apply. But 
for the most part, we try to delay all of these things. So if someone's ejection fraction is 25% and I'm seeing them for the first time, instead of scheduling them for a defibrillator implant, even though they may have had that ejection fraction 25% for over a year on optimal medications, I'll put them through an aggressional, aggressive nutritional detox regimen to see if that ejection fraction can improve. If that ejection fraction goes above 35%, I've avoided, I can avoid implanting a defibrillator. And we've had lots of patients where we've done that. And I'll show you some data in terms of how we do that. But uh, so the integrated approach that we use consists of medical services and health and wellness services and their culinary services, as well as education and research. Um, we have uh, three wellness coordinators who are on site. They're both trained to do EKG, stress tests, but two of them are nutritionists and one is a certified fitness person. Uh, and so we uh, have a yoga class on um, mornings. Uh, some of our patients, we prescribe yoga in addition to nutrition. Uh, we do fitness assessments, uh, the meal plans. So when we prescribe a design meal plan, we have a restaurant on site. So individuals can come and I'll write a prescription for a certain meal plan that's ideal for hypertension, heart disease, it's all plant-based. And our nutritionists will follow them and follow their data. Their shopping rounds are different programs that educate individuals on in terms of how to maintain this lifestyle uh, long term. And that's on the culinary side as well. So, and we also track our data. I'll show you some of that in some of our research that we do. Uh, so what is the application? Uh, you want to evaluate and medically stabilize the patient, as I said, categorize their health condition, and prescribe a certain food level range. It's not enough to say eat vegan, although you know, that's a very good start. But many people who eat vegan may go out and have french fries or potato chips, and if someone's in heart failure, that's not the best approach to take. So we have to be very specific, and so we've developed a, a novel food classification system that not only talks about what you eat, but how you prepare it. And so it's a zero to 10 scale, uh, and uh, I'll go through that in just a minute. Uh, but here's some images of some of the food that we uh, recommend. Many people who uh, are not familiar with eating a plant-based diet, when you say you cannot eat chicken, fish, or eggs, you know, their mind goes blank. They so there's nothing else to eat, you know. It's no, no chicken, no fish, no eggs, no, you know, what else, what can I eat? And so we have to demonstrate exactly what to eat. So individuals will get a sample meal platter, we'll bring them something like this, some of our Asian rolls, our nori rolls, and various other things. We have raw pizzas and various things that we bring them to help uh, uh, exemplify what it is they can eat. So as I mentioned, the food classification system, zero to 10 scale, uh, the five basic characteristics. What's the fundamental source of the food? Is it plant, animal, inorganic, mineral, et cetera? If it's a plant-based food, then it gets a lower number. In other words, zero, the, the lower the number, the healthier the food. If it's an animal-based food, it immediately gets a higher number. It's above six, and we don't recommend eating anything from zero, beyond zero to six, to so level six. And then uh, conditions that it was developed. Was it organically raised, conventionally raised? Level of processing. You know, broccoli, if you pull it from the garden and consume it, that's minimally processed. But we take the broccoli and deep fry it. You know, we process it. So fried broccoli may be out on our scale next to fried chicken. So uh, just because you're eating broccoli doesn't mean that you're eating something that's healthy. It's what did you do to the broccoli? How did you prepare it? And the basic chemical characteristics of the food, is it well hydrated, et cetera? Think foods that are dehydrated are less healthy than foods that are not dehydrated. And so uh, those are the factors that we look at in the food classification system. Now, the classification system is, is pre-designed, so you don't have to go through that, that, uh, that uh, mental gymnastics each time you analyze a food. Uh, I'll show you uh, a slide that uh, gives you a diagram that we give each of our patients. So, but the benefit of the food classification system, it gives a structured nutritional plan, goes beyond usual calorie counting and portion measuring, allows for measuring of compliance, and allows for evaluating uh, efficacy. So in other words, our patients, once they understand the food classification system, and it's in my book, as well as I'll show you a slide, that they'll come and say, well, I've been eating some zero to three all week, or I've been eating zero to four. My, my nutritionist may sit down and get, go through a food history and find out what they're eating. And so if you're eating zero to four, that's where we want you. 
and we can mark your compliance just based on the classification system. Uh, and it enables therapeutic precision. Uh, here's a, a picture of our facility and, and more uh, things here. The key to the facility, and again, as I said, we're developing a prototype. So this model is under design as we speak, uh, but one key will be it'll be an independent location. You know, there's a well-known um, fast food chain that has golden arches. I won't mention names. <laughs> but uh, the uh, founder of this entity was uh, lecturing at Harvard Business School, and he was famous. Uh, he asked the students, okay, what kind of business am I in? And they said, well, you're in the you know, hamburger business. He says, no, I'm in the real estate business. And, and part of the point is that you know, that business had to develop sort of collateral approach in terms of how it's going to grow and develop itself. And I think this model here will, may have to take a similar approach. We're looking at developing a prototype and, and, and franchising the prototype. And location is key, as with lo in real estate, location is key. And that well-known uh, fast food chain, you may be very familiar with Google Maps and what have you, but before we had fancy Google Maps, they used to have to take aero maps with helicopters and planes and the like. And when that industry was developing, one of the big drivers behind that industry was this you know, well-known uh, fast food chain because they were trying to map out where new development of neighborhoods were. And so they were trying to locate their stores there. So a similar approach in our prototype would be to develop uh, this approach, I should say, would be to develop the prototype and then try to expand it. So the components would be an independent location with free parking. Uh, we have uh, medical rooms, on-site diagnostic, uh, on-site restaurant, on-site fitness facility. Uh, we have ECP therapy rooms, which is a non-invasive way of treating heart disease. So the basic concept of the prototype is a well-contained, self-sufficient facility where individuals can go there, get all of their therapy, and be converted. So as opposed to going to a large medical center and going to many different specialists, you go to one facility and your conditions are controlled there. We have two different uh, programs, basic program delivery models. We've actually developed uh, a third, but um, we do a food prescription plan, which is where patients come uh, in the office, and this is where they can use the insurance. Because many people say, well, I can't afford to go to one of these you know, luxurious getaways. Uh, how can I use my Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever? Well, we integrate it within the clinical practice where individuals will come, they'll get a medical visit, they'll be seen by myself or one of my nurse practitioners, and they will then uh, see a nutritionist and we'll start them on the detox program right then and there. So they have scheduled events, it's all pre-scheduled, they'll get on meal plans, and we'll follow them weekly for the first month and then monthly for the two months after that, tracking all of their data, also weaning their medications because it's not only a matter of putting them on natural food, removing the unnatural food, but we also have to wean the medications and that's a careful clinical process. If somebody's on 100 units of insulin a day, then we have to follow them clinically. And so I may see them on day one, they start on raw detox, I may cut their insulin in half or remove it. We'll see them a week later Okay, and say, well, uh, where's your blood sugars now? They're running a little high. We may give them something or may you know, not give them anything. So we'll just monitor their blood sugars, monitor their blood pressure and their clinical condition as they go. Uh, we may introduce yoga or some other fitness uh, therapy somewhere down the line once the body's properly nourished. Uh, so phase one, as I mentioned, is uh, we go through a raw detox. And then phase two is a two-month maintenance. So we put them at cook plant-based foods. So we put them on a more stringent regimen of raw for the first month. Sometimes we'll do a juice feast for the first month, so they'll just have nothing but raw juice, and then we'll back them into a regimen that's more uh, uh, maintained. Uh, the, the raw detox phase make this maintenance phase much easier. By the time they've gone through, as I like to say, grass and water for four weeks, <clears throat> then after that period of time, and it's not literally grass and water, but uh, to them they feel that way. But once they've gone there, then bean soups and steamed broccoli is like heaven to them after that first month. We also have a weekend program called the Nutritional Boot Camp Class. Now that's a group setting, the food prescription plan, each individual is seen as an individual as a patient, so you almost follow individually there, or you are followed individually there. <clears throat> and, the, and the boot camp is a group setting, so individuals come on Saturday mornings, again they follow a similar detox program, it's a one month curriculum, 
where they are seen weekly, five sessions over four weeks, and what happens is <clears throat> they go through the detox program, but their group lectures, educational videos, shopping rounds, our nutritionists follow them very carefully through the program. It's non-clinical, private pay, uh, and so you don't have to use a medical diagnosis for this, but for the food prescription plan, most people come in, or virtually everyone comes in with some medical condition that we're treating. Uh, and it's open to the general public, and not only patients, uh, and then, um, it helps you initiate a healthy lifestyle. Now, individuals who go through our food prescription program, once they've graduated from that, we'll also get them in our boot camp class a lot because the group setting also helps in transitioning your life because you're working with other people uh, that are doing this. Let's look at a case uh, example. There's a 59-year-old man who came to see us, and uh, he wanted to undergo a wellness program. He was having some fatigue, some eye pain, and some headaches, uh, not very much, no chest pain or shortness of breath or any uh, cardiac symptoms. Uh, on physical exam, his blood pressure 136 over 81. He had a very high total cholesterol, 317, LDL cholesterol 227, HDL cholesterol 70, triglycerides 286. But that, what really wasn't brought, what, that wasn't what brought him to us. Uh, it was the fact that he had recently been diagnosed as a diabetic. He had a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3 and uh, his CRP was 1.4. So his doctor said, well, you're an early diabetic, pre-diabetic. By the time you're over six, in my book, I think you're diabetic. But the point is, he was labeled as a diabetic. And so his doctor wanted to start him on medication. He didn't want to start medication, so he came to see us. So diagnosed type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. Uh, his dietary history ate lots of fruits and vegetables, a little bit of fish and chicken, little eggs, some skim milk. He exercised two or three times a week. So you look at that on the surface, lots of people say, that's not too bad. You know, what more can I do? Medication, he only took Excedrin for some weird eye pain that he had. And he had undergone a detailed uh, ophthalmology workup and uh, the eye pain, uh, there was no diagnosis found. So we started him on a detox program. And I'm going to go through this real quickly. These are the options, medical therapy alone, medical therapy and complex lifestyle change or food prescription alone. I give you a little quiz option. We chose C. Okay, we put him on a food prescription on large because that's what he came for. Uh, we start him on a detox from 0 to 4B for the first four weeks. Not a bite, drop, or crumb or anything outside of 0 to 4B. Uh, we left him on his medications. And this is a diagram, a, a slide of a diagram showing what we show. So level 0 is here. This is the detox phase. But you shouldn't go past level six. And this shows all the different uh, descriptions of what can constitute zero to six. I'll spare you that. This is the zone from level zero to three. And sometimes four is a detox zone. The slow healing and maintenance zone is the level six. And disease development progression zone. And as I like to say, the uh, Montgomery Kids College Fund contribution zone is level seven to 10. Uh, and so you want to try to avoid level 7 to 10. So we have these compliance cards. We start them on the detox zone. After about a week or two, he had increased energy. And the interesting thing, that eye pain that he had, that nobody could figure out what the cause was, it went away after about 10 days of the food prescription approach. And it recurred on the day that he sort of fell off. He went to level 7 on one day, and pain recurred. He got back on the program and went, went away. So we were able to measure his compliance. So week one, he stayed zero to three, 100% of the time. Week two, zero to three, 100% of the time. But week four, he had one day where it went beyond seven, okay? And so uh, he fell off, then got back on. And so we were able to accurately measure throughout the whole first four weeks at 17.9% of the time he was at level zero, 78.6% of the time, zero to three, and then 3.5% of the time over seven. So we can measure and quantify his compliance using this food classification system and it's given some accuracy. Systolic blood pressure dropped over time, weight went over time, this is just in the first four weeks. Cholesterol 30 day changes. His total cholesterol went from 317 to 189. LDL 227 to 116, and uh, his uh, HDL dropped, but it didn't drop to the same extent that the LDL dropped. Uh, the drop in the HDL is not a problem. Usually it's because the body doesn't need as much uh, HDL 
Triglycerides dropped from 286 to 84. C-reactive protein went from 1.4 to 0.5. Hemoglobin A1C went from 6.3 to 6.0. Now, hemoglobin A1C dropping in one month, uh, you might say, well, that's an average of three months blood sugar, but the drop in one month probably has to do with the decrease in swings in blood sugars. 30-day overall clinical changes. Notice how blood pressure and weight dropped around 10%. But if you look at some of the biochemical markers, the cholesterol dropped around the 30 to 40% range, and inflammatory processes dropped over 70%. So you're seeing these uh, minute biochemical changes changing at a much greater extent than the anthropomorphic uh, changes and some of the gross hemodynamic changes. Case two is a 65 year old person with coronary disease, had prior, two prior MIs. And so this is somebody with extensive heart disease and had an ejection fraction of 35 to 40%, and they'd just been in the emergency room with chest pain, they ruled them out for MI, heart attack, and so they brought them to see us. And we measure a special uh, molecule called troponin. And troponin is, is, is an intracellular molecule, it's one of the um, components of the uh, contractile apparatus of the heart, and if the heart's under a lot of stress, it'll leak a lot of troponin. So we know a troponin level of 28 uh, picograms per ml, puts him at high risk. So we put him on the detox program, and then after a week, his troponin level went down to about 5, 7 to 14. So troponin level dropped significantly over a period of time uh, with the nutritional detox. So here's a graphical display of that. And so we see that the amount of stress on the heart is decreased not four or five years later, but within a matter of weeks just by implementing a nutritional detox uh, program. He was on glipizide, which we thought may have been contributing to some chest pain and some stress here, and we stopped it. His troponin level went down even more. So, <clears throat> hemodynamics. How do you assess somebody's cardiac function? How do I know how well your heart's working? I don't have to go and do an angiogram. I can look at different hemodynamic parameters. We can measure what's called ejection fraction on an echocardiogram. If it's less than 50 percent, it's a problem. It's relatively greater than 50% is normal. It's going the wrong way. The stroke volume, that's the amount of blood that the heart squeezes out with each contraction. We can measure that non-invasively. Uh, vascular resistance, you know, resistance of flow, cardiac output, that's the total body circulation. Uh, we can look at that. And we can also look at heart size. Bigger is not better from the standpoint of heart size. So if you look at these uh, uh, different parameters, we can get some idea of cardiac performance. So here's a group of about uh, 15 individuals who has a history of hypertension, and we measured some of these cardiac parameters uh, non-invasively, uh, and uh, we followed them uh, in the nutritional detox program. What did we see? We saw that their cardiac output improved, their stroke volume improved, the vascular resistance decreased, the thoracic fluid content decreased, and the heart rate decreased as a result of the heart pumping more efficiently. The systolic and diastolic blood pressures uh, decreased significantly, as did their weight and waistline. And as we measured these things, we uh, found an interesting correlation. So we used a mixed model, had a, a statistician use a mixed model measures, and they looked at different trends, how these things, so it's not only one thing to say these things went down in a month. So how did they decrease? There's a linear trend, which is a straight decrease, a quadratic trend has one bend in the curve, and a cubic trend has two bends in the curve. So if you look at blood pressure and systolic and diastolic, they had a linear and a cubic trend. Weight and BMI had both a linear and a quadratic uh, decline. If you look at waist and uh, circumference, they had a linear and a quadratic uh, trend. So there was significant difference between how blood pressure decreased and weight decreased. What do I mean by that? If you look at blood pressure, you see after week one it drops and then it comes up and goes back down. And drops, this is diastolic, goes up, comes back down. That's a cubic trend. But if you look at weight, Okay, it's a quadratic trend. It's sort of down, down, and down. Only one bend. If you put these superimposed, you see the weight going down, but blood pressure bumps up. Now, why am I making a big deal of this? I'm making a big deal of this because we often say, well, your blood pressure comes down because you lose weight. But this goes against that. The trend, the way in which your body loses weight and the blood pressure improves are different. And so, Nutritional excellence 
the biochemical effects that is affecting blood pressure is independent of weight loss. So you can have skinny people who may not be losing any significant weight, they can still have the same physical changes, biochemical, uh, physiological changes with blood pressure reduction. So don't say that weight, blood pressure improvement is secondary to weight loss. It's not secondary to. They may happen similarly at the same time, but the, the mechanism is different, and the trends uh, show this. Uh, here's some hemodynamic profiles. The cardiac output goes up, which is good. The stroke volume goes up. Again, the stroke volume is the amount of blood the heart pumps with each beat, so you want that to go up. The resistance to flow goes down, which is what you want. The rest fluid content improves and the like. So if you summarize all of these anthropomorphic and hemodynamic changes that you see in 30 days of plant-based nutrition, stroke volume improves, circulation improves, the rest fluid content, your body's volume status improves, the resistance to flow goes down, the blood pressure, systolic and diastolic goes down, as does the weight. So you wonder why people are feeling better. They're feeling better because you have better flow. It's better flow throughout your circulation. Your brain's getting more flow, okay? And so you're improving. We had a series of, uh, a group of three patients, we had, a card had the benefit to do a cardiac MRI before and after uh, um, a nutritional detox. And so the question is, can it, has a, can it have an effect on the structure of the heart. So cardiac MRI is probably one of the best tests to look at the structure and anatomy. So I can see how thick the heart chambers are. I can look at and see how well the heart's pumping. <clears throat> and so a cardiac MRI gives a lot of detailed information. So these individuals had heart failure uh, for more than a year. The ejection fraction was 22% or less for more than a year, on average 22%. And uh, most of them do, had it due to ischemic heart failure. So we put them on food levels 0 to 4A for about six weeks. And uh, we did cardiac MRIs before and after. The average follow-up time for the three subjects was 78 days. And what do we see? Similar to what we saw with our non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring, increased ejection fraction, improved cardiac output, increased stroke volume. But one thing we can see on MRI that we couldn't see on the other tests is we saw a decreased mass. The heart was getting smaller the heart that was hypertrophied regressed. Uh, in diastolic volume decreased, in systolic volume decreased. We were able to measure those things on MRI. So although there's more work needed, these results are very promising. Uh, someone with an enlarged heart can shrink their heart. Now notice, individuals who have an ejection fraction of 22%, they get a defibrillator, they get put on a transplant list, there's a lot of therapy goes into that. So if we can reverse that, went from an average of 22% to 42%, just on plant-based food alone, then they don't have to walk to those heart transplant centers. They can avoid defibrillator implants. You know, on the transplant, if you get on the transplant list, you have an LVAD, you live in the hospital for about six months or, or longer sometimes waiting on a heart transplant. So you can aggressively change these things in a very short period of time. So the cardiac MRI changes, LV function improved, stroke volume, cardiac output improved, uh, LV mass, the heart's got smaller and more efficient and stronger. Here's one of the individuals who was a 46-year-old lady who came and saw us and she was part of that group. And uh, I did an angiogram on her and we saw a 90% osteal LED lesion, left anterior descending coronary artery. And uh, she was a walking time bomb and she elected not to undergo surgery. Uh, she went through our food prescription program, uh, and as before, we assessed the clinical condition, optimized the medical therapy. Uh, she started on food level 0 to 3, really 4B. We optimized the medications uh, with those medications. She got, went through the ECP external counterpulsation therapy to uh, control her symptoms early on along with the food. But here's a list of, the, the, of what we give our patients, and we've mo notice we focus on food to avoid. And this is the big emphasis. I don't say eat this much broccoli, this much green. We do say that. But the hardest thing to get across to patients is not eating this. And it's not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb. And so she followed that. And after five and a half months, the snow went from there and it opened up. LV function went from 24% to 50%. So she avoided a fibrillator implant, avoided a massive heart attack, avoided possible need for transplant, et cetera. So, uh, we do look at biomarkers as well. They help us as surrogates uh, uh, of uh, improvement, especially early on. 
Uh, and here's a, a, a picture of the biomarker analysis uh, of, um, and notice, and this is an uh, average of 200 subjects that went through a, one of our programs, uh, our boot camp program. This is our boot camp data, it's an average of 200 subjects. We've had over 1,000 people over the eight years who've gone through our boot camp uh, who've, who've had similar results. But notice the weight, blood pressure around 5%, cholesterol around 10%, inflammation around 30%. So the point is that even though we look at weight loss and we make a lot out of weight loss, the real magic is happening at the cellular level. And you're seeing more drastic changes, and these changes are really what's leading the other changes. And it's probably about a six-fold difference. How old is too old? Well, I alluded to this last night. Uh, on February 21st, this year, I turned 52, going plant strong. And this patient of mine, on February 22nd this year, she turned 102. So 52 and 102, and she's going plant strong. She came to office, and she was on seven medication, had heart failure and long history of hypertension, other chronic ailments. And uh, we put on a detox and, and uh, plant-based diet, and she's doing great. And uh, it's got a lot of great family support and uh, so on. So here's a short history lesson. Uh, there's a picture of Dr. Uh, Simmelweis. He's a Hungarian physician who practiced in the, the, uh, in the uh, 1800s. And uh, Dr. Simmelweis uh, ran birthing centers. And around that time, uh, peripheral uh, fever, peripheral fever, childbirth fever, was very common. About 10 to 35 percent individuals died of childbearing fever. And he had two different birthing centers where one, the incidence of death was about 1 percent, and the other, the usual 10 to 35 percent. He couldn't figure out the reason. But he did some experiments and some uh, analyses, and he discovered one thing. At one birthing center, the medical students were delivering the babies, and they would, in the morning time, they would go and die, uh, dissect cadavers. In the evening time, they would go and deliver babies. The other birthing center with the 1% uh, rate had midwives, and they were just delivering babies. So as it turned out, he came up with this magical intervention that if I had the medical students wash their hands after dissecting cadavers and before delivering babies, he was able to get the death rate down to 1%, and that center just was the other. And so he says, oh, this is great. I have this new intervention, hand washing. So he presented it to the medical society, and they say, you're crazy. You know, at the time, these women are dying from all many different unrelated diseases. Uh, but Semmelweis' hypothesis is that, look, you know, if, it's, if you just wash your hands, you do well. Well, he was persistent. They felt he was crazy. He was banished from the medical community. Uh, he was committed to an insane asylum. And after two weeks of being committed to an insane asylum, he was beaten to death, and he died. And it wasn't until years later that we discovered the germ theory, uh, presented by Louis Pasteur. Dr. Joseph Lister started applying hand washing, and as a result, Semmelweis's work was finally recognized long after his death. Um, so, but what? Wait. I said the death rate was 10 to 35 percent, right? That means 65 to 90 percent of the people were surviving. So what's wrong with me dissecting a cadaver and delivering your baby. You have a 65 to 90 percent chance. Of, remember the example of, you know, Uncle Joe's 94 and smoke and ate bad food? Uncle Joe survived, right? This is the, these are the Uncle Joe's. So why do we make a big deal of hand washing? Well, the 10 percent is a pretty big number, okay? And so if your chance of one in 10 of dying, if I don't wash my hands, you can say, well, why don't you wash your hands? Okay, it doesn't make sense, in other words. Uh, also, the medical community thought that those deaths were due to, what, different unrelated causes of diseases. Remember the tree I showed you? We think of all these chronic illnesses, unrelated, different diseases. But there's one common disease, okay? Just in that case, the common treatment was hand washing hands, okay? The common treatment for us is going to be to wash our food, okay? We need to apply 
natural plant-based food to our systems all the time so that the body is healing and repairing itself as it is designed to do and not relying on us taking some pharmaceutical substance to suppress some symptom or suppress some, uh, normalize some biomarker. So, in conclusion, the true disease. What's the real truth about disease? We're here at the conference, the real truth about health. Well, I'm gonna, the real truth about health, we're gonna address the real truth about disease. Well, the real truth about disease, this is not the disease. This is the manifestation of the disease. Disease is here. So it doesn't matter if I did your angiogram and this looked normal. If you're consuming this, then you have a disease. And it's just only a matter of time that that disease becomes progressive enough to whether you say, ouch, or you pass out, or something else uh, terrible happens. But the important thing is that we have to understand the disease starts with the poor lifestyle uh, problem and the crux of the poor lifestyle problem is what we consume. If you consume the right food, then you're able to what? Exercise, you're able to go outdoors, climb, and do all the other wonderful lifestyle things that are important as well. If you poison the body, even if you are doing those things, you continue to poison the body, the body's gonna degenerate such that you're not able to do those things. So it's really important uh, to follow that. So, what is the proposed future outlook? How should medical care be delivered? What, what should you expect when you go to your doctor's office uh, Monday or the next time you get an appointment? Well, you want them to optimize clinical management. Uh, we wanna look at uh, patient feedback, clinical progress, continued research, um, an integrated health and wellness center, you know, an on-site restaurant. You know, it used to be when you go to a gasoline station, you just get gasoline, right? Now you go to a gasoline station at what? Convenience stores, and little, you know, fast food places, the gasoline stations have changed. Doctor's offices need to change. A doctor's office should not just be a place where you come and get a prescription. The, the doctor's office of the future should be where you go and eat and have exercise. Instead of going to Bally's, Maybe the doctor's offices should be fitness centers where you go have yoga, get your, your blood pressure checked and your heart checked, and you're going to yoga every day of the week or every day of the month and getting a checkup periodically, making sure you're doing the right yoga techniques to keep your blood pressure down. Make sure you're doing the right juice feasts and eating the right types of plant-based foods. And you just monitor your health condition instead of just uh, palliating uh, your health condition. Uh, and investigational goals, I think right now we need to look at other diseases. I've shown you data on advanced heart disease. We're currently looking at atrial fibrillation, the most common cardiac arrhythmia. And, and atrial fibrillation, one thing that underscores atrial fibrillation is inflammation. And we have data that shows that the, this approach can reduce inflammation very significantly in a matter of four weeks. And so we will look at uh, individuals that can put implantable devices under the skin that can monitor the heart every day of the week for four years, and I can look at the atrial fibrillation burden, and we're gonna look at their uh, AFib burden and how well they do on a plant-based diet. Ventricular arrhythmias can also be monitored, LVH and other things, future MRI studies will be done. So there's a lot of work that, can be, that needs to be done to show how efficacious this approach is with individuals with advanced heart disease. Uh, I think it's very important, so someone with a Low ejection fraction, instead of being immediately put on a transplant list, I think that they should immediately be put on a juice feast, nutritional detox, and medication optimization program. And I think many of those people, if not all, most, I think, can recover and avoid uh, these aggressive therapies that we have. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, this is a copy of my book. You can uh, text that for more information. Questions or? Okay, great. Uh, yes, first, right? Yes, ma'am. The second part is how beneficial is infrared saunas? Oh, wow, wow. that's great. Uh, first of all, stress. Stress contributes, stress is sort of an, uh, an insult. So let's say, for instance, you know, you undergo some traumatic life event, you know, death of a family member, somebody breaks in your house, 
burn it down and stuff like that. And, oh, you're in a lot of stress or you go through a divorce or something like that. So that's, a, that's an environmental insult to your body, to your cardiovascular system. If your cardiovascular system is in bad shape, <clears throat> then that insult is going to have an adverse effect on you. In other words, if you have a vulnerable plaque that's ready to just break off, then catecholamine levels that go up and all the things that can happen biochemically as a result of stress can maybe lead to a heart attack. However, if the body is fortified, optimally nourished, and functioning in, a, in an ideal manner, then you can undergo those same stressors and not have that heart attack because the underlying physiology and biochemistry of your, your, your body is more fortified. It's sort of like saying, you know, what effect does, you know, uh, walking out in 20 degree weather have? Well, if you're naked, no shoes on, you're going to get frostbite. But if you have, if you're covered, if your body's fortified, you're not going to get frostbite. So the environmental insult will have a different impact depending on how well you're fortified uh, within. And from the physiological standpoint, that's a nutritional fortification. The example I gave you is just a clothing fortification. Now, you said infrared saunas. I have no information on the effects of infrared, infrared saunas uh, on cardiovascular disease. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any data of anybody doing any studies. Yeah, I'm familiar with the theory. I just don't know. I haven't looked at that data on that. But it's, it's, I know a, a, a naturopathic practicing physician that is looking at that that has one of those uh, devices. And in fact, this infrared sauna is another type of device that's supposed to do improve small vessel uh, dilatation. We use ECP therapy, external counterpulsation therapy. There have been uh, multi-center clinical trials showing that reducing ischemia, reducing chest discomfort, it's like an external balloon pump. And so that has scientific data that actually has shown the benefits of it. I'm not, I'm not aware of any you know, multi-center trials showing benefit of infrared sauna and, and some of the electromagnetic approaches that's supposed to increase uh, small vessel uh, uh, dilatation. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, what would you suggest for people that go to the gym? So it's said that before you go to the gym, you need carbs for energy, mm -hmm. and then after the gym, 45 minutes later, to have protein in order to repair muscle. So mm -hmm. could you comment on that? Because so many people are into whey protein. Yeah. I see it all the time in the gym, and uh, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Way too much protein, huh? No. Uh, the, the, a whole lot of carbs, I mean, really your diet should be about 70, 75% carbohydrates anyway. So consuming carbohydrates, I guess it depends on the types of carbohydrates you consume. Um, I recommend to my patients in the morning to start the nutritional regimen with lots of fresh fruit. Now you can do raw juices and things like that in addition, but lots of fresh fruit. So whether it's apples, watermelon and like. The, the reason for that is the number one nutrient is water. So you want the body well hydrated. You know, you need, you know, I showed data on thoracic fluid content. In order for you to have an adequate stroke volume, you need filling pressure. So the heart needs to be, uh, have adequate filling pressure so that you can perfuse adequate. So water is really the number one nutrient. And, and if you eat lots of fruit, you get your carbs and your water at the same time. And, and so that's what I would tend to recommend. Now, you can have bananas, which may not have as much water content as an apple or watermelon, but it has more calories, it's more dense, and so if people want more calories and more density, that, that works. So I agree with the increased carbs uh, before a workout, but I would emphasize carbs in the form of fresh fruit because it gives you the water uh, and it gives you healthy carbohydrates as opposed to other types of carbs, some people may eat pastas or other processed carbs, which may not be optimal. So you have to be careful in terms, and that's why I don't like to, and I know it's a part of our natural convention to say carbs or protein, but the body doesn't recognize carbs and protein. The body, if I eat an apple, the body says, here comes an apple. I eat a banana, I say, here comes a banana. I eat a piece of chicken, here comes trouble. Uh, the, the, the point is that uh, the body recognizes whole foods. And so if I'm eating a banana, the constituency of that banana is more than just carbohydrates, even though we know it has a lot of carbohydrates in it, but it has many other things that are along with that carbohydrate. So it's really a whole food 
that the body is recognizing, and it's recognizing many aspects of that food that we have yet to discover. So that's the other thing we have to understand is we haven't discovered every aspect of the constitution of food, and so we think we know what's in it, but we don't. And so that's why you eat the food and don't wait 3,000 years before we figure out what's in it. And post-workout, post-workout, again, fruits and vegetables. You want to hydrate post-workout, too. So I would still have a lot of fruits, raw juices, et cetera, post-workout. Uh, when I'm working out with my trainer, he's putting me through some crazy stuff. I'll have raw juice. I'll have about 48 ounces of raw juice before. And after, I may drink 16 or 24 ounces of raw juice. I worked out on just a raw juice feast. And so the whole idea of protein... Uh, for, for repair, I'm sorry? Amino acid, repair. amino acid repair. But you get all the essential amino acids for most fruits and vegetables that you need. And the body's going to make up the protein. You don't have to drink whey, you don't have to eat eggs, you don't have to eat a animal protein. You don't need any of that stuff. Uh, really, uh, amino acid repair, and then, again, if you're consuming natural plant-based foods all the time, you know, you have the constituent essential amino acids that you need, and the body's constantly uh, repairing these things. So the liver is constantly able to repair those things. You don't have to, you know, consume some whey protein or chicken or eggs after you work out just to fix, you know, you know, protein. That's, I don't know where that came from. You know, trainers come up with that stuff. But, but the point is that you really don't need that. And the body, you really need to hydrate the body. And if you're eating, consuming uh, plant-based foods on a regular basis, the constituency of amino acids uh, that's necessary are there, even after workout. Uh, oh, microphone. Okay, yes, no, can we, yes, ma'am. Um, my question is on the beef. You are totally anti-beef for this, um, and just you're just looking at plant food. So I understand that part. Um, with the beef, um, organic grass-fed that would be totally out as far as you're concerned? Or have there been any studies in, you know, versus the toxic GMO beef versus organic? And that's the question. Yeah. The, the problem with beef isn't so much the toxins in the beef, it's not the antibiotics in the beef, it's the beef in the beef. You know, that's the problem. It's, you know, patients say, well, you know, what if I had organic chicken? It's not the fat, in, it's the chicken in the chicken. And so the, the beef, if, I, if, if you had the, 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 the purest beef, I mean, they had this commercial where Bluebell ice cream is in Brenham, Texas. It's out of Texas. And so they used to have this commercial where you have cows. The cows think they're in heaven. You know, that's, that's where we get our Bluebell milk from. So if you had cows that, were, that thought they were in heaven, they, you know, they, they, were, they sung to them every day. They had the best organically raised grass. And, you know, they were treated with all kindness and, you know, they had, you know, pedicures on the hoofs and all that stuff. You did all the wonderful things to the cows. If you ate them, the food would still be toxic to your system. Because the biochemistry, the inherent properties of the cow itself, that's bad for you. And it's not because bad things are done to the cow. It's just the cow is not fit for human consumption. Our bodies are designed for the consumption of plant-based foods and plant-based foods only. And that's the, the key. And, and, and so we get into this whole myth about organic and happy cows and happy meats and all this stuff. It's, it's you know, it's, it's nonsense. I think the microphone and then I think, uh -huh. um, Dr. Montgomery, um, concerning um, the health issue with like, people being put on dialysis, I know that's dealing with the kidney, but what would you recommend for them if they're already being put on that list or already started to get dialysis? Yeah, great question. So the question regarding people on dialysis or at risk for getting on dialysis, first of all, if you're, if you're almost on dialysis, you're at risk for it. If uh, we see a number of patients in this condition, we put them on a plant-based diet and, and, and some of them were able to turn around uh, they're able to turn around and avoid dialysis. Um, we see a number of people who are already on dialysis, and they'll see the, the, the dietitian, the dialysis dietitian. And, and the interesting thing about the dialysis patient, if you look at the population of patients with dialysis, you know, in the dialysis center, they measure albumin level. Albumin is the predominant uh, protein in the human bloodstream. And, and what they 
notice that in the centers that have a low albumin level, the mortality is higher. So these people die faster with the lower albumin level compared to centers with higher albumin levels. So the thinking is that if we can just get the albumin level up, we can improve their survival. So what do they tell them? Well, you need to eat more steak, chicken, and fish. So they see patients on dialysis that they say, well, your albumin is low, so we need to get your albumin up. So how do we get your albumin up? Well, we've got to get your protein up. How do you get your protein up? You've got to eat more steak, chicken, fish, bacon. And these are dietitians telling them that. And so when I have the patients, I say, look, I'm the boss. I'm the cardiologist, I'm top of the food chain, do what I say do, blah, blah, blah. And to some extent, it works. But the question is not so much, you know, the albumin is low. The question is, why is the albumin low? Well, albumin loss, there are two major mechanisms I can think of. One is that you're not making enough albumin, and two is you're losing too much. Okay, so somebody who has inflammation, let's say you catch pneumonia uh, or, and you get sepsis. In other words, your bloodstream gets filled with bacteria, you get pneumonia, it seeps your bloodstream, so you get rushed to the hospital, you're in sepsis, blood pressure a little bit borderline low, and you get put in the ICU and IVs are put in, et cetera. If we were to check your albumin level, the albumin level would be low. Well, why is that? Because inflammation causes capillaries to leak. So albumin is a large protein, and when it goes through capillaries, the normal openings, the fenestration of capillaries, you know, is such that albumin can't pass through. But when the body goes through inflammation, those fenestrations or openings increase in size, and albumin can leak through. It can leak from the intravascular space to extravascular space. So if I measure your albumin in the blood, your albumin level will be low. So that's one way. Increased inflammation is one way albumin goes down. The second way albumin goes down is that the liver is not making adequate amounts. So you have liver congestion. Well, how do you get liver congestion? Well, we know that alcoholics can have liver disease, but there's a lot of patients without alcohol, is 16%, I showed you that. But we see a lot of people with liver disease without alcohol abuse. And what, so what's happening there? Well, meat, processed foods with different chemicals that the liver is pr processing, medications, all put stress on the liver. And so we see a lot of individuals coming with low-level liver dysfunction and therefore decreased albumin production. Many of these individuals on dialysis have many chronic illnesses, on many medications, so they may have liver dysfunction. So I make this point for a number of reasons, but by and large, when we see one thing on a blood test, we try to correct it directly by saying, well, eat more meat. But we're not looking at the pathophysiology of the process, which is the low albumin is due to probably inflammation and or liver dysfunction. How do you address those things most effectively? A plant-based diet. So we put our patient on dialysis on a plant-based diet, the albumin level comes up. And the number one way that someone on dialysis dies due to cardiovascular disease, not due to a low albumin. I've yet to see a patient die from protein deficiency. There's this huge myth about what do I get my protein? How about protein? I eat protein. I've yet, I've practiced medicine over 20 years, and I've practiced in the world's largest medical center, and I've yet to see a patient die from protein deficiency. But, but that's a big myth on the patient with dialysis. Thank you very much. <laughs>